and welcome to yet another episode of Two Guys and a Lot of Wine. I'm your host, Bobby P. And I'm James Kimbrough. And we're going to be talking about one of my favorites next to being out at the beach, getting some sun, drinking a good white Sauvignon Blanc gin. It's that time of year when the weather starts to get a little warmer, people switch from red wines to whites, and I couldn't think of anything better to drink than a nice cold Sauvignon Blanc this time of year. And we're going to get you started on, I think, four to five really good ones, hopefully. Some of them I haven't tasted yet. And I think, Jim, you haven't tasted some of them there's yet either. A, there's a few new ones in here for me as well. I'm looking forward to it. And as usual, I just want to give a shout out to our new neighbors, uh, Steve and Christina Getton, who, besides doing a great barbecue, have a phenomenal wine collection themselves and entertained us quite well last week. So <laughs> thanks again, Steve and Christina. And I wanted to give a quick shout out to Monica from Jonathan Edwards Vineyard. Uh, we just met uh, tonight before the show, but it was, it was a pleasure talking to you. And we'll be having you as a guest on our show very soon. Yes, we Thank wanted you. to do a, a Connecticut Vineyard show, yep. too. So that would be something to look forward to. It's my future. favorite vineyard in the state, so I, I can't wait to get her in here. So jumping right into Sauvignon Blancs, for me personally, and the reason I love them so much, especially this time of year, is because they're not a heavy white, they're a crisp white, they go great with a wide variety of summer foods, whether it's a barbecue, hot dogs, burgers, similar to a Pinot Grigio, I think. It's a very versatile wine, and it has such a wide range of flavors. Uh, it's amazing how much you can get out of one grape, but uh, depending on who the, uh, the manufacturer is, you can get grassy flavors, you can get uh, fruity flavors like a melon or a uh, citrus or guava, pineapple, uh, and then sometimes you get into more of a, a mineral taste or a flinty taste, so it's, it's got a a wide range, and you can pair it with a lot of different things. So we're going we're gonna to find some of those pairings tonight. But well, I think what's great also is we have some regions that are the same. So we're going to be able to taste some differences between, say, uh, California or South African Sauvignon Blanc and see if we could tell the difference. I mean, see what the differences are between the two uh, regions, depending on where they're from. And uh, it's, to me, they're all good, but tonight I might be unpleasantly surprised as you might be. Uh, there's always a, a surprise in every bottle. So I think we should jump right into it because we have quite a range of uh, wines here tonight. So, All right. Jim, what's our first one tonight? We're going to start off with the 120. Uh, this is from Chile. And it's actually named after 120 patriots who helped liberate Chile back in uh, 1814. So this, this is uh, bottled in their honor. And I have tasted this one before. So you're not going in as a virgin. This is not a blind wine. tasting for me, but let's see what you think of it. And as we discussed before, you generally don't have to swirl white wines before you drink them. Right? You don't, but it's, it's habit for me. Anytime it is. I, anytime I get wine in a glass, I just start swirling. And generally yeah. when you're out and you're doing it, you look somewhat sophisticated. <laughs> and people think you know what you're doing. So it certainly doesn't hurt to do it. So let's see what the bouquet is on this one. Citrusy. Citrusy and a, a little bit of a floral note. Yeah, that's uh, generally the kind of flavor I expect for a There's a lot of fruit at the, at the front of this and uh, more of a peachy taste in the middle. And it, it kind of lingers towards the end, so it, it doesn't disappear like some of the Sauvignon Blancs. Uh, it's generally the type of Sauvs that um, I find enjoyable because I do like that fruity sort of smack in the face as soon as you take a sip. Um, it's not too heavy. It's not too oily. And I don't think I've ever used that word oil before, but there are some that's whites. A, that's a good description for a white. Uh, yeah, some of the whites are oily. This one, however, um, doesn't have the bite that a lot of the Sauvignon Blancs have. So, you know, sometimes you'll taste a Sauvignon Blanc, and it's got so much citrus that it, it almost has a sharp bite to it. I don't get that with this. This is just all fruit. So if, if you're looking for a sweet, fruit, fruity kind of wine, this is a good one to pick. Yeah, I would say that the first taste tonight, this is exactly what I would uh, immediately gravitate to in the store if I had sampled it. And if you do have a chance to uh, watch the show and taste some of these, feel free to use your own judgments. But I think um, as of right now, this is a, a plus for me. It's this a great one. wine to serve in the summertime because it's uh, inexpensive. This is actually under $10. So oh, that is? That's an under $10? That's an under $10 wine. So oh, that's phenomenal. Which is why that goes great with especially picnics and barbecues and stuff like that because you really don't want to put something too expensive outside the picnic table because, once again, Grandma, Grandpa knocks the bottle over. There only goes a $10 bottle, not a $20 <laughs> or $30 bottle. This is a great wine to serve. Uh, I wouldn't be embarrassed serving this at any occasion. No, so. absolutely not. Absolutely not. This is a, a good choice, Jim. And uh, 
Salute to you for the first Salute. one. Salute. Now and we're going to go into a completely different region, I believe, correct? Yes, this is uh, the Sincerely. This is South American. I've had this one a number of occasions, uh, and it's, it's more of a minerally taste or a flinty taste. Now, is there a particular reputation that South African whites have, unlike, say, California whites that you're familiar with? Are they, do they tend to be a little bit more on the... Uh the ones that I've tried have been more on the minerally flinty side, um, but you can get that in any region. Very mild. Mm -hmm. Very mild. Certainly not the type of um, strong, stringent flavors we had from the uh, first bottle. No, there's, there's almost no fruit taste to this. Um, and then in the middle of it, you get more of that flinty, minerally taste I was describing earlier. Kind of a, almost a stone taste right now. And then it fades away. There's, there's really no finish to this. Though I think this might be something that pairs well with maybe um, meat on the grill, like maybe... Uh, Absolutely. I, I don't yep. think you might want something too citrusy for like a hamburger or no, a rib or something. If you're going to have something that's on the grill, you know, you're going to get that charcoal taste. Uh, this would be a good pairing for that. And it's very affordable, um, I, and I wouldn't be afraid to serve it in, in most situations, um, but if you have friends who want something fruity, steer clear of this one. Now, how did you particularly find this particular bottle? Did uh, somebody recommend it, or you just found it on it's one of your many? It's just one of my many wine tastings. You know, right. I, I was following my own rule. I was trying it before I bought it, and I went out and tried this at a wine tasting and fell in love with it. So I, I bought a few bottles, and it's, it's been in my wine fridge ever since. And as we've said numerous times, mm -hmm. that's what we really want to emphasize. Do exactly that. Go to wine tastings that there are tons of locally in the area, and uh, experiment with the different wines that they're tasting that particular day. Because that's what we've done. That's why, uh, you know, we enjoy so many different varietals because we tasted so many different varieties. <laughs> so it, it doesn't that's, hurt. No, that, and that's how you get to find the kind of wine you like is just by going out and experimenting. Um, and that does bring up my second rule of thumb, which is drink what you like. So we're drinking all Sauvignon Blancs tonight, but if you are a fan of reds, even though it's the summertime, you can keep drinking the reds. Okay. Well, it's another interesting point because I know a lot of times, um, especially the ladies, if they drink a lot of white wines, they sometimes say they get a headache. But I don't necessarily think, I think that might be an old wives' tale. I think it might be the type of wine that they're drinking. Like maybe a shard, maybe in the summertime isn't the, a heavy shard isn't the way to go if you're sitting outside in the sun. That could be. Uh, I always say if, if you're prone to headaches, uh, just drink a lot of water in between your glasses of wine. And keep hydrated. That's true. And once again, this one, though, it's not quite as flavorful, and I think that's the profile I would use, quite as flavorful. Mm -hmm. As the first one, I still think this would go well um, with a lot of different foods, especially outside in the summer. Though I think it needs to be chilled. I, I think if this got a little warm, absolutely, it yeah, might, you want to uh, drink this one cold. It might lose something. Yeah, but it's a great contrast from the first wine. You had so much fruit in the first one, and then so much mineral taste in the second one. Mm -hmm. Very good it contrast. Sh it shows actually. you it shows you how much of a range uh, the Sauvignon Blanc grape has. It's it's very dynamic grape. And you yourself, uh, the first time you, uh, were you always a fan of the Sauvignon Blanc, or did you have to slowly build yourself into liking a Sauvignon Blanc? Uh, this was the first white that I fell in love with. You know, I started off drinking reds, uh, Merlot, and then red Zinfandel, and then the, the, the big cabs. Uh, but then I, as I moved into whites, uh, it was a Sauvignon Blanc that I discovered first, and it, I still call it my first love amongst the whites. And maybe it's just me, but I still think sometimes if you have a, a, a Pinot Grigio, sometimes a Pinot Grigio can give you the same type of, uh, aftertaste or same type of strong citrusy flavors as a Sav can. This, the Pinot Grigio tends to be uh, a little bit watery, in my opinion, but you're right. You do get some of the great flavor. It just uh, typically fades away very quickly with the Pinot Grigio. Usually those, those wines don't have any kind of finish yeah. at all. Uh, so you, you get a lot of flavor in your mouth and then it's gone. And I know in past shows, sometimes I've, I've sort of given mixed singles on Chardonnays. I know there are a lot of fans of Chardonnays out there. And we're going to do a show probably just on Chardonnays in the future because I still have come around to liking a lot of different Chardonnays. I, I have a few favorites as well, and I, you know, I'll be happy to pull those out of the, the locker and bring but them on the show. I just want to emphasize, I think these, what we're drinking tonight, um, are or not, you can't characterize them in any way, shape, or form. As a Chardonnay. Well, the, you know, with a Chardonnay, uh, usually you get a big oaky taste with that, or, or sometimes a big buttery taste. It's a, it's a very strong, almost overpowering wine in certain situations. Whereas this is a very light wine. Uh, very. Across the board, every one we're going to taste tonight is going to be very light. 
Um, you, it's not going to be something that's, that's going to linger f for a very long time in your mouth. Um, and, and it's, uh, I think the best thing to be drinking during a hot summer day or um, next to the campfire. Well, I'm extremely excited about the Nexa because it's from New Zealand. And besides being a beautiful country on its own, I'm really kind of interested to taste this particular one because I haven't had a lot of experience with New Zealand, New Zealand uh, sauce. So. Hey, they make some great wines too. So this is the Matua. And though we didn't talk about the first two, um, I know you've seen us do the legs on a wine before, how it holds up on the glass, whether it slowly drips. That doesn't always apply to a white. Yeah, with, with the whites, you're not always looking at, at body. Though there are some shards that have a lot of body. There are. You know, they, they say the Chardonnay is the red that drinks like uh, the white that drinks like a red, and then the Pinot Noir is the red wine that drinks like a white. It's it's a very weak kind of watery wine. And then there's only me and Jim who drink like us. <laughs> so let's give this one a taste. This is the Matua. This has a little bit more of a bouquet than the Sincerely. That's very tropical. That's. Uh, that's almost like the, the guava that I was talking about earlier. Um, and that's lingering for quite a while, too. That's, that's quite a surprise. Actually, that's one of the first things I noticed, besides, once again, being a little bit more on the citrusy side. The flavor of this particular one definitely is lingering more than the first one or mm -hmm. the second one, which is something to consider. Like, when you, if you try these wines that we're trying tonight, and, uh, you know, depending on how you're going to pair them, if it's just going to be casual or with dinner, Take these things into consideration, because if you have a white like we're drinking right now, that is a lingering aftertaste, that might change what you're going to serve. Or oh, absolutely, yeah. And if uh, even if you're going to serve it on its own, you know, this is a wine that can stand up on its own. You know, if you didn't have anything to serve, uh, you were just popping a bottle for some friends. This would be a great selection. I've always wondered about whites and cheese pairings. I know red and cheese pairings is, you know, that's easy. But are there any types of white or types of cheeses that you enjoy more with a, when you're drinking a white wine? I still prefer a nice sharp cheddar or a sharp uh, type of cheese. But, I mean, is there something that goes better with a white? I, you know, I'm in the same camp as you are. I prefer something sharp. Um, I don't have specific preferences for Sauvignon Blanc um, or cheese, for that matter. I, I'm equal opportunity when it comes to eating cheese. As you can see, we are equal opportunists <laughs> when it comes to either wine or cheese. So... I'm going to take another sip of this one. Now, though this has warmed a little bit, obviously, with the lights in the studio, I still really enjoy the flavor of this one. Mm -hmm. And even though it's been sitting for a while, even though it's a little on the warmer side than you would generally serve it, this still holds up pretty well. It's a standout. Uh, of, of the three we've had so far, this is my favorite. But I've liked them all. Yeah, I'm actually a little disappointed. I thought we'd have a little conflict tonight. <laughs> um, but... That's what's great about Sobs, because generally, they're all generally pretty good. And there are some differences that are either slight or very pronounced. But even the ones that, like the second one, the Sincerely, which is on the milder side, is still enjoyable in its own mm -hmm. quirky way. So I, I almost brought you a surprise tonight. There was a, a Mulderbach Sauvignon Blanc, which has kind of a gunpowder taste, which is, I'm not going to say unpleasant, but it's, uh, it's not what you're expecting from a Sauvignon Blanc. And it was, it was a bit of a departure from what we typically taste, and that was, that was the reason why I, I was thinking about bringing it tonight. But we've got so much to taste that yeah, there just wasn't room for it. It's interesting because I know I've, I've heard you in the past mention the, the gunpowder taste. And there's actually a kit, I believe, that you can get that has a lot of different types of flavors associated with wine. Um, yeah, if you go to thewineenthusiast.com, you can get a kit. Uh, it's a fairly expensive kit, but it, you, it'll show you all the different uh, aromas that you'll find in wines. And, and you can, just by sniffing it, you can start to associate uh, the, the thing that you're smelling with what you'd pick up in a wine bottle. Have you actually so used that on your own? Or? I have one. I haven't opened it yet. We'll be doing this soon. So you haven't used that kit yet? No. That's interesting, Jim. Of all the wine drinking we've done, I, I was assuming that kit would have made an appearance by now. I tell you what, by the, the time we do our next show, I will have opened it up and played with it. Yeah. <laughs> well, once again, this is really good. And um, another classic example of how a good salve can pair with a lot of great summer food. Because I'm a summer guy. I'm a spring guy. As you can see, I got some color. I like being outside. Um, that would be in the cooler just like that. Absolutely. So, good yeah. choice. And we're going to move on to the Oracle now. 
And this is one you brought in, so why don't you tell us about this? Another example of a South African um, sob, which I really like a lot of the South African stuff, especially the whites. This comes highly recommended by the same guy who recommended the <laughs> Italian on our last show, which turned out to be a bust. So have I you, gave him another chance. Have you tried this? I have not tried this. Okay. Okay, but he assured me that after the dismal failure of the last episode with that particular wine, that if he failed me again, he would be cut off. So now you're killing this guy. <laughs> <laughs> and once again, I, I, I really love a lot of South African wines, whether it's red or white. The, the climate and the temperature there is really perfect for wine. Well, you know, it's funny. You, you talk about uh, South Africa, and we've had a couple of Chilean wines. Uh, when you think of the Sauvignon Blanc grape, uh, this actually originated in France. And so people start to question, you know, if it's a Sauvignon Blanc that's not from France, is it any good? Uh, well, you look at uh, Chile, for example. The Chileans have been producing wine since the 1500s. So they've got a lot of experience under their belt. And as you can see from what we've had earlier tonight, they, they, they make a very good wine now after you know, 400, 500 years of experience. Well, it's interesting. I know, I know we didn't want to go into too much technical detail of wine making because that's not what the show is about. It's a very casual look at wine. But I actually did not know what you just said, that Chilean's been making wine that long. That long, I thought yeah. it was a relatively in the last 100 to 200 years. Well, that, and that was my uh, perception also. But what happened was there was a huge explosion in Sauvignon Blancs from Chile back in the 1980s. And that's, that's when I first became aware of them. Uh, but they had uh, some severe export laws that were in place before the 1980s, which kept anyone from North America drinking a Chilean wine. That's fascinating. Yeah. Just a little history tidbit for you. That was my Spock moment. Fascinating. <laughs> fascinating. <laughs> All right, let's so on to now. South Africa. Light bouquet. Now, this is a really good comparison here. Mm -hmm. um, I think this compares with the Sincerely. It's mild, but has a little bit more kick to it than the Sincerely. I get a little bit of fruit in the middle. Uh, not as much, certainly, as the Matua or the 120. Uh, but, I, yeah, I don't get that mineral taste that we had with the Sincerely. But it's, it, it, like the Sincerely, it's, you know, it's not doing this. It's kind of more of a, a smooth, even taste throughout. And I know there's some viewers out there who might be watching us tonight and uh, saying, well, you know, sobs are not complex enough. You know, they're not sophisticated enough. And please, don't follow that myth. Because remember, when you're drinking a wine, especially a sob, you're drinking it for a particular reason. You're drinking it especially if you have friends over, you might not want to be too complex with uh, their palate, with their uh, judgment of the wine. Because we have a lot of wine snob friends. And we love indoctrinating them into covering stuff up and having them drink stuff that they think they're not going to like. And there's a couple bottles here that I think some of our wine snob friends would be quite pleased with. I've enjoyed everything we've had so far. I would not be ashamed to serve any of this. Yeah, this one, the Oracle, once again, all these wines are available locally. So uh, I believe the Oracle and the Uppercut are available either from um, Liquor Depot out in Avon. And I'm not sure if, if you know where the ones you serve. Uh, the 120, the Sincerely, and the Matua all came from Super Cellars in Avon. So if you do want to go out and try these, please uh, you know, give us a plug. So <laughs> <laughs> Now, what's the price point on the Oracle? The Oracle, I believe, is between, depending on, there's a several places you can buy it, it's priced between $11 and $14.99. So, again, an affordable wine. And a great drinking wine. Yeah. I mean, you could, if you are not careful, you can consume a lot of that wine. <laughs> well, that's the plan. <laughs> well, that was delicious. And I must say, I've been very impressed with our four bottles so far. And is there anything in particular, especially when it comes to the 120, which I think, I think I need to know a little bit more about Chilean wines itself. The reds, along with the whites, they all started at the same time. There wasn't like just reds being produced, or they just produced whites and reds at around that same time. From, from what I understand, the Spaniards brought the whole gra uh, grape growing technology to Chile in the 1500s. So it, I don't know if they started off with reds and then moved to whites or if they just did it all at once. But they, 
the Spaniards were the ones who introduced this to, to the Chileans. And did the Spaniards, um, this isn't a history class, but I'm just, <laughs> this fascinates me. Much like the Italians who drink wine culturally, uh, does Chilean wine drinking also involve more of a cultural um, sitting at the table, having a glass of wine with a meal and so forth? Or is it strictly for like a special occasion? I, honestly, I don't know. I, that's, that's a great Something question, to Bob. Look up. Something to look <laughs> up. Well, you know, ever since uh, our last show with Jordan, when we talked briefly about uh, how do you pair wine with food, and, you know, we talked about Italians and, and French wines, and there's two distinct cultures. I mean, Italians, I think, drink wine. It's part of their, their milieu. It's part of what makes them mm -hmm. Italian. Now, the French drink wine the same way, but at the same time, it's more of an art for them. Yes. It's more like, yeah. uh, what's the word he used? Uh, <laughs> something along that line. It's, uh, they take it a little bit more seriously. Is that a technical term? Yeah. <laughs> that is a technical term. But um, it's just, I, I've always been fascinated about how cultures develop their wine tasting and their, their wine industry. And well, a lot of times it just, it grows around the food that they grow in that area. So if, uh, especially in the Italians, it's a great example of this. You know, they use a lot of tomatoes in their uh, dishes, mm -hmm. so you get more of an acidic base to the food. So you have to have a wine that's going to pair well with a, with a highly acidic food. Uh, whereas, you know, the French are famous for their cream sauces, and it's you know, yeah. more of a cheese and, and creamy kind of texture in the mouth. Uh, you need a completely different kind of wine to pair with that. Actually, that also, before we go to our next bottle, I want to emphasize these wines go great with spicy food. Yes. So if you're a big spicy food fan, especially Mexican, or you like really cooking those hot wings, these would pair fantastic with any of that type of food. It's, it's a great selection. Um, sometimes I stray more towards a Riesling with really spicy food. Uh, you get more of a, a sweetie, uh, kind of almost syrupy taste with a lot of the Rieslings, which helps cool down the, the spiciness of the hot food. But these would go very well uh, with you know Thai food, Mexican food, absolutely. Which I love, and I do love my spice. So now we're into our highest price point tonight. So this is going to be very interesting, and we've always talked about Price should not determine value. Not at all, but it, this is still under twenty dollars, right? It's still under twenty bucks, but I think this is the highest priced one tonight. Okay. So I know you've had experience with Uppercut. It's a uh, North Coast, California, and uh, I believe they do make some really renowned reds. I believe. I've, I've had a couple of their reds also. That I, I love the vineyard. I and once again, these are available locally. Now, some people will say when you start paying a little bit more for wine, you get more complexity in the flavor. It's something that me and Jim don't always agree on. With Sauvignon Blanc, there's not going to be a whole lot of complexity. So I think you're better off sticking to a lower price point and finding a great value, uh, something that has a lot of flavor at a lower price point, instead of trying to spend two or three times as much money to get a little more complexity. It's, it, you're, just, you're not going to get much more bang for the buck with the Sauvignon Blanc. Now, once again, uh, bouquet, not really smelling much on this one. No. You mentioned oily earlier. Mm -hmm. And this seems to be a little more oily than anything else we've had tonight. Well, once again, I know we talked about legs just moments ago. And, uh, I mean, look at that. Yeah. That's really... Yeah, this this probably isn't going to show up on camera, but th this, this does is fresh cling. Glass, yeah, so. this clings to the glass a lot more than anything else we've had tonight. So there's a lot more body in this, and, and that oily characteristic that I was describing earlier is not unpleasant. It just uh, it's kind of that mouth feel that I'm getting. It's the, the wine is clinging to the inside of my mouth. This might be something I'd be very specifically paired with, like say I'm a big fan of Thai duck, like a spicy mm -hmm, Thai duck. Mm -hmm. Um, this might be something that might go good with something like that. I would almost be tempted to serve this with something very dry so okay. that this would help wet the mouth. And then you'd eat the dry food and then wet the mouth again with this. Very interesting. I'm not sure where I stand on this one. I'm going to need another sip to uh, determine. I'm not sold on it yet either. And I, ha I don't want to dish up a cup because I know they make some really spectacular stuff. But this is so distinctly different than the other four. Um, I don't know yet going to find out, though. And I don't know if our palates are shot at this point. I mean, we've, we've gone through four other wines. Well, you know, it's another interesting point. Generally, if you do wine tastings, especially some of the Connecticut vineyards, you're supposed to really drink a little water, clean your palate a little bit. Now, obviously, time constraints don't allow us to do that. <laughs> so um, we're sort of winging a little bit. But 
I still think this has a little heavier body to it. Absolutely. A lot of body here. Uh, and something else you can do to cleanse the palate is eat a cracker in between each wine. So for, yeah, we'll probably have to do that for the next show. Well, generally we would do that, but I think the cracker sound might affect the microphone. <laughs> so uh, we don't want our listeners turning off the phone thinking there's some static electricity problems on television. So we'll have to uh, find another way to do that. But well, i got to say, Jim, all in all, tonight, we tasted five sobs, which I'm really impressed with. I didn't think we'd have time to. In general, I'm going to give thumbs up to all of them. I'm going to give a thumbs up to everything except the uppercut. Is that a half cut or is that a down thumb? I'll give the uppercut the half cut. The half, well, okay, yes. that, that's interesting because that was the same one that I was going to possibly give a half one to. Yeah. But just to be different, <laughs> I went from the half. You're too I, easy. I pushed it up just a little You're bit. You're too easy on these guys. But, you know, the thing is, what's great is, you know, before we wrap up tonight, it's spring. When you see the show, it's almost going to be summer. Don't be afraid to go out and try these wines, whether it's the ones we have here or different sobs, or especially a Pinot Grigio or any whites. We've said before, don't be afraid to try no. stuff you haven't tasted no, before. No, but, but follow my rule of thumb. Try it before you buy it. And drink what you like. And Jim is, Jim is just like I am. There are so many places that offer free wine tastings in the area. Every Saturday, yeah. Uh, usually from 1 to 5. Just uh, If you travel around, you can, hit, you can probably hit a couple of these if you're really into wine tasting. Uh, this is what I I'm, do be on a regular basis. Of course, be yes, responsible. Yes, get a designated driver. But uh, you can hit a couple of different uh, wine distributors throughout your area and taste a lot of different wines in one day. And, you know, you're just going to get a small sip, so uh, it's not going to be too much alcohol to consume. But and generally, a small sip is all you need to know whether you like something or not. Right. I mean, there are exceptions. Like, mm -hmm. sometimes I've been sold. I had to take a few sips that really turned me on to the wine. But in general, I think uh, one or two sips, you'll know whether you like it or not. So, but don't be afraid. That's what this show is all about. And uh, I think you'll be in, you'll have a nice surprise our next show. I think we're going to have a nice guest, possibly. Uh, we're, uh, we've got a couple of different options, so we'll see who we end up lining up for, for the show. All right, so stay tuned, and uh, we hope to see you again. Once again, I'm Bobby P. And I'm James Kimbrough. And until next time, keep us in, in your, your wine, wine cellar. cellar.